Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Society for Ad Collections meeting webinar titled The Practice of Ad Collection. Um, today, we're going to be discussing um, critical issues around ad collection, the practice of ad collection, the business of ad collection. In 1974, Bernanon painted Tutu, the iconic Nigerian portrait that was lost for decades. It sold for a record £1,205,000, about $1.68 million more than four times the highest estimate in 2018. The portrait of the Ife royal princess Aditutu Ademiluyi was missing for more than 20 years until it was discovered in the London flat last year, uh, in 2018, the same year. The sale of this artwork has indeed sparked a lot of global conversation about the business and practice of art collection. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you again. And today we have um, a highly esteemed panel who will be helping us navigate this subject matter. On the panel today, we've got Ijoma Lauren Okeke, who is a project and arts project manager and an arts enthusiast based in South Africa. She currently works in a consultative role with the Aseli Institute in Nigeria. Over the past three years, she's worked with Kauru, a thinking outside the box and repositioning the organization's offerings. She has utilized her continental network to foster partnerships that has changed direction and vision for the organization, making it a truly dynamic, innovative, and developmental platform for young black curators with a focus on female curators and artists in South Africa. She has worked for five years as a regional network development for the Visual Arts Network of South Africa and as a project manager for the prestigious gallery Momo in Johannesburg. Where, she's, uh, where she manages both in, in, international, continental, and local projects. She's the daughter of the Nigeria's foremost artist, Uchi Okeke. We've also got Tio Kaoma. Tio is an art enthusiast, boarding collector, and Ugandan by birth. He's based in Cairo, Egypt, and is the director and global head of human resources for the African Export Import Bank, Afrex Bank. He's also a founding member of the Contemporary Art Society of Uganda, CASU. He holds a BA and an MBA from the Makerere University, Uganda, and is a chartered fellow of the Certified Institute of Personal Development, CIPD UK. He's a certified balance scorecard champion and alumnus of the INSEAD Leadership Transition Program. As a practicing organization transformation specialist, he has expertise in the areas of HR, strategy, financial advisory services. He has worked for Africa, for African Bank for over the last 10 years. Previous, prior to that, he worked for Lafarge Holcim, PwC, and KPMG. In addition to collecting contemporary African art, Tio is an avid tennis player, golfer, and amateur photographer. Philip Gaston, another highly, um, highly um, distinguished panelist. Philip Gaston is an accomplished financial professional and an avid art collector. He created Villa 306, Villa 306 is a house dedicated <coughs> to contemporary art and culture in Côte d'Ivoire. He advocates cultural democratization and cultural democracy. Philip wants to make contemporary art interact with all audiences, having them question the intermediation of the global market of styles in the paths of building identity. In addition, he believes that this will allow us to show an image of art being made through many trends of contemporary art. We want to welcome our highly esteemed guests and also everybody who's joining us from wherever you may be in the world. And we're just going to invite uh, Ijoma to give us our opening statements as regards the practice of art collection. Ijoma, over to you. Thank you very much, Obina, and welcome to everybody that's joining us and, of course, to my fellow pan panelists. Um, I think um, collecting art is something that is uh, peculiar to everyone. I mean, everybody has their own unique... Um, reason why they, are, why they begin to collect. Um, but I think for most people, um, it's a passion. And secondly, it's an investment. So it just depends on, on, on why you want to collect and what interests you and how passionate you are about art. And it's also, you know, I think one of the important things is also to think about why you want to collect art. What are you collecting art for? Is it for your own pleasure? Is it as an endowment to your family? Um, or is it... Uh, something that you want to give as a donation to like a public, public institution, you know, uh, a private collection, something like that. So you need to be thinking about why you're collecting and what will happen to the collection after you're not there anymore. Great. Thank you so much. We need to figure out what happens to the collection, especially when you're not there anymore. Thank you very much, Ijoma. So we'll go over to you, Theo, for your opening remarks. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, First, I think I'll respond to that question by talking to you about why I collect. I collect, one, because I've got a passion for, for the beauty that comes with 
with creativity of that. So, you know, when you look at these works um, hanging on your wall, or if it's a couch hanging in your corridor, there's a beauty that, that you get as a result of, of that, that feeling of beauty. But the second thing is that I look at art as a form of expression. So whenever I am looking at a piece, I try and understand the story behind it because somebody has taken time to create this work. What are they trying to say? There's always a story behind the art. So I try and relate to that story and try and make a story that speaks to me from what the artist is doing. And sometimes the artist's story is different from my own. But there's always, sometimes there's a synchrony between their story and the story that I get from, from the art. So I do that because the art speaks to me in one form or another. The third thing is because as an African, I think that we've had a problem with the manner in which our traditions and cultures are expressed to the rest of the world. I think art is created by African artists has got a way in which it helps to speak about our culture and tell a story about our culture in a manner that is positive rather than a lot of the stories that we tend to hear about the continent, we generally tend to be negative. So I look at it as a, as a form of cultural symbolism and expression as well. So that's why I call it, and I hope that people can resonate, can resonate with, uh, with those feelings. Thank you so much, Theo. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, from wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go quickly to, to Philip um, Gaston, who will give us his opening remarks. Philip. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, hi to my panelists. Um, art collection, um, everything I've read, and the art, my, why I collect is uh, to make a point of my essence of being here in this world and uh, to educate our former um, African counterpart uh, because the, the art um, I've have some issue to really be well perceived in the world and well perceived in our continent. And it's important that we, we collect it and uh, try to, um, to evaluate it um, to the society. I don't know if you make it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to ju jump right into um, into business. I, I just uh, thank you so much for everybody who's joining us. Um, if you have questions as we get along, please type the questions, and um, our administrator will, will handle the questions. So Ijoma, um, in terms of pricing and value, is it better to collect from a secondary market, or rather than the, the primary market, like from an exhibition, fairs, and auction, or directly from the artist? I think each market. It has its own role, you know, it plays its own role in, in, in this situation. And um, there are a number of factors that drive that. First is, you know, um, the, the professional level of the artist. You know, how, how long has the artist been in practice? Is it a master or a mid-career artist or uh, an artist that is just emerging into the market? You know? And um, I believe that most collectors, of course, would like to um, directly from the artist because <laughs> that makes sense. That cuts out the middleman, obviously. But there's a reason why people should collect from galleries or you know through auctions because, in terms of having a professional end-to-end -end transaction, dealing with those sorts of institutions it has its benefits. And um, as the work has better visibility and exposure through these exhibitions, whether locally or internationally, mostly internationally, of course. Um, and that goes for like auctions and uh, for international art fairs. And most importantly, the artist value increases as the work is exposed on various important platforms or written about in publications and um, important exhibitions with catalogs, you know, documented, so to speak. You know, so that makes the art more valuable, obviously. You know, and that also dictates the pricing as well. So the, the primary and secondary markets are sort of, you know, they're working organically, more or less, you know. 
um, if you have the opportunity to collect directly from an artist, especially an artist that is uh, uh, highly visible, that is beneficial to you as a collector. You know? um, but of course, an artist having a, a professional career, which is uh, managed by galleries or institutions through exhibitions, through collaborations and partnerships and important projects that also adds value to your arts. Thank you very much, Ijoma. Thank you so much. Um, Theo, so we're going to come to you now. Um, so to, can you tell us um, what is the importance of keeping an inventory for your art collection? Thanks, Sabrina. Um, I think this is, first of all, something that we tend to ignore because a lot of us think that cataloging or inventory keeping is for people that have got large collections. But, uh, you know, I've been collecting for eight years or so. And one of the things that I learned from my friend, Jess Castellot, who runs, as you know, Jess is the Prince C.M.C. Shilon Museum in, in Lagos, which is one of the few, you know, museums which host a private collection of Prince C.M.C. He said to me, you know, about that, that uh, if you don't catalog your work, if you don't make an inventory of it, what you are doing in effect is that you're locking out everybody else from the knowledge about this art. So imagine you've got this piece, you bought it from person X, and there's nothing about it. If somebody came to you and they wanted to just understand what's the story behind this art, who did it, when was it done, what's the story behind the artist who created it? If there's no catalog or inventory, Nobody can tell that story. So it's important for us to do that because one, it is, you're able to tell a story about the work, whether it is now, whether it is 20 years later, even when you're not uh, present or available. Secondly, if you are going to be able to get your art into the secondary market, then it's important that you're able to actually have a catalog of it. Who did you buy this art from? What is it all about? What year was it made? What media, etc.? All of those are important aspects of cataloging because that's how you get your art into the secondary market. So the point I want to emphasize is that cataloging is important because it helps you to tell the story about the work that you have to the public. And one of the things that I strongly feel is that art cannot be art except if you're able to share, share it with the public in different forms, whether it is exhibitions or whether you hang it up on your walls and get people to come and see it in different ways. That's what makes art useful. It is a story which must be told. It's like a book. When you get a book and it's written, you want people to read it. Art is the same thing. So one of the things that I did is that I use an app called um, Catalog It. It's a very useful app because you know, you scan the, the work and then you type, out, you type out a form, you know, what was the artist, what year was it done, etc. cetera. You capture information in, in, in there. But most of all, it's important that when you buy the art, please get a certificate of authenticity from the artist, whether it's from the artist or from a gallery or from wherever else. That's also important so that you can keep it for provenance purposes. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Theo. Uh, you know, um, a certificate of authenticity for, for, for purposes, you know, that are very, very important. Thank you so much. Um, so, Philippe Gaston, we're going to come um, straight to you. Um, now, we understand that um, purchasing uh, at, um, um, very valuable works of art, you know, it can be a very expensive venture. So, it brings us to the issue of insurance. How do you go about insuring your work? What do you look out for when you are insuring your artwork, Philip? Well, you need there is few things that you need to be um, you need to um, to be careful. Is usually you have a house insurance. If you are if you are profound in art, you must you you might think that your house insurance cover your art collection, but you really need to be uh, to be careful. To what is it in your art insurance and what does it take care of? Because not all the insurance cover fine arts. Uh, you have, uh, you can, 
pour chasse euh, euh, policy, special policy insurance that is specialized in fine art that will be able to take care of your art and um, uh, uh, you need on the top of that you need to be particular you need to make a particular attention because not all the insurance cover damaged art so you might have a piece because you are traveling or because of some uh, uh, weather so, so one of your art pieces have been um, damaged and your, you think that your insurance policy should be, should, must cover that but all, all the insurance does not cover all the every aspect so sometimes it's good to go through a broker that is specialized in fine art if you have some um, art that is important to you and that is valuable uh, you you should go to a broker and purchase a special insurance policy that will be able to cover everything that uh, uh, you got and especially help you to appraise your art later on when you when you want to to do uh, to do investment mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, Philippe. That, that's well, well said. Uh, Lichum, we're gonna come uh, straight to you. And um, now, is art price like other commodities? Like, is there a bargain from the initial price? You know, how, how would you approach this issue of pricing at works? Um, <laughs> I want to say, first of all, that art is not like other commodities, obviously, mm -hmm. you know? So there are, there are various factors that, that come into pricing of art. As I mentioned before, the, um, you know, the professional trajectory of the artist, of course, is quite important, you know, because um, an artist that has been professionally managed is, is, is a professional artist, builds his career or his or her career from, you know, a certain point to a certain point. So obviously those are important things to think about. And of course, the master artist, and there's the mid-career artist, and there's the emerging artist. You know, so that's one of the things. And of course, again, as I mentioned before, um, where has the art been seen? It's very important. Has the artist been in important exhibitions? Um, has he done important projects? Um, you know, um, at what level is his art? At what standard? Quality and those sorts of things. So. Uh, it's very important that you know um, that you think about those things when you're buying um, art. So I'm just trying to look at my notes. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, oh, sorry. And yes, of course, I will have to say, um, you know, that it's not easy to quantify an artist's um, talent and effort, you know, what artists put into producing a work. So you can't be selling it as if you're selling pepper or tomatoes. You know, so these are like intangible um, aspects of, of the artist's work that cannot be quantified. But then you still have to put a price in on the arts anyway. You know, so um, it comes down to talent and training, and you know um, how the artist, the mastery of the artist in terms of technique um, and ideas and concepts. So being an artist requires time and requires effort and intellect and self-discipline, obviously. So all that goes into the pricing, you know. And pricing of art at the highest level is complex and it's a sophisticated and very subtle transaction. So um, <laughs> it's not something that is just, you know, done the way that you just price groceries or you're buying uh, musical equipment or those sorts of things, you know. So, um, it is not a commodity, but it's an object of great value, you know, and it's not easily reproduced, obviously. So that is some of the things that, that, those are some of the things that you have to think about. And from the perspective of galleries and auctioneers and art fairs, it's a high-end product uh, that, you shed, that should fetch substantial prizes, you know. So it's promoted as a luxury good, and 
you know, unfortunately elitist. So it's not something that people just go out of their way to buy. You have to be really interested in it. So all these are elements that go into the pricing. So um, it's not uh, something that you just, <laughs> um, you know, um, just put any kind of price on. So pricing, pricing of art, it requires a lot of things. That's basically the message I'm trying to send here. Okay. So you mentioned something that's quite interesting because you mentioned about it being a luxury good and, you know, being a litigant. And... Now, that's, that's very clear. That's, that's something that's, that's, that's established. But for people, for our collectors who may not necessarily want to start at the high end, you know, what exactly, yeah. you know, how exactly do they navigate the waters of trying to become collectors, especially if they don't have, they have a keen interest, I mean, you know, but, you know, how do they get into that market as, you know, trying to be collectors in, 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 in their own right? I think it's important to, of course, do your research, go for exhibitions. And I would encourage going for exhibitions at universities, for example, you know, um, graduating students, because you get some good talents there. And these are people that are going to be emerging into the market. Yes, if you start collecting from that point, and um, when the work adds more value because they become more visible then, you know, so you can start from there. You can start from prints, for example, um, photographs, you know, um, but, but mostly looking at emerging artists and looking at mid career artists as well, you know, that's more affordable. And you can see that art fairs are now trying to have more affordable art <laughs> as it is. Um, so I think that's, that's a big, a big source of, of buying art that people have not really tapped are these institutions that have art departments, you know, that have art schools, because a lot of the talent is coming from there, obviously. So that's one of the ways, you know, and also um, making friends with artists as well, you know, because if you build a relationship with an artist, they are, they are bound to sort of view um, some kind of um, discount now and then, you know, and also introduce you to other artists. Um, and they might have other younger artists that they see will, you know, eventually um, start gaining value. Their works will start gaining value and they can introduce you to that. So it's just basically being in those circles and seeing um, what you're interested in, and, you know, who you want to buy from. And sometimes even the artists that are highly prized, you know, if you build a relationship with them, you can also decide to um, reduce the price as well. Or even gift you with some art now and then depending on how you support them, because it's also a symbiotic relationship. All right. Thank you so much, Ijama. And Theo, we're going to come um, straight to you. Um, now, do you simply buy what you like, or is there a sh defined strategy to your collecting? Um, I would say it has evolved over time. In the beginning, and, uh, you know, many years ago, I think my focus was really more on what's visual appealing to me. And that's really, you know, I see that on the street. I like it. I will buy it. But uh, over time, I think I've evolved into more of, uh, I've evolved more, you know, as I, as I understand the industry and how it works. And as I expose myself through, you know, visiting galleries, um, meeting up with artists in different uh, uh, forums and, uh, you know, reading art, uh, reading what art writers are writing and art critics and all that. So if we, if we categorized art in two four forms, and uh, Ijoma has talked about that, so let's assume that you have a group of what you may call unknown artists, and some artists will remain unknown for, for, for the for their lives, for the simple reason that, you know, they're doing simple art, street art, to make some money to survive and all that. So, you know, they're never really going to make it into the annals of great artists, so to speak, because the factors that make one a great artist are very Then you have that group of what you may call emerging artists. These will tend to be young artists who've graduated from an art school, or some of those that have picked up the talent on their own, but for various reasons, engaging with the uh, various people in the industry, they start to get noticed. And then they become middle, what you may call rising stars, if you want to use that word. And you notice that, you know, to get to become a master, obviously it's a pyramid. So the pyramid kind of reduces as you go. 
And as the pyramid reduces, the prices increase. That's the way it is. Not everybody will be able to do a painting that sells at $5,000 or $10,000. That's not the way it works. So as we go along, my taste has essentially shifted to focus quite on the, on the, on the range of uh, what you may call emerging to rising. Um, obviously, it's also affected by, by, uh, by what can be afforded. So um, some masters are obviously out of reach, depending on, on, on what you look at. So that's really uh, uh, the, the, the focus that I have when it comes to, to collecting. But of course, what's important is that it doesn't change the fundamentals of what I look at when I'm collecting, which I spoke about at the beginning. It must be visually appealing. So however, whatever else uh, people are saying about an emerging artist, if I look at the work and it doesn't appeal to me, I will not buy it. Second, if I look at it and it's not telling a story that I can relate to in one form or another, I will not buy it. So the fundamentals remain, but my focus is more on you know, what you may call emerging to rise and start. All right. Thank you. Now, the, the, uh, I'm going to move to something that's really, really important. And I feel that a lot of people want to really hear about it because it's something that keeps coming up and coming, you know, coming, um, that usually reoccurs. Now, how do you research on provenance? Of the you know the artwork to you, I'm going to put that question to you. How do you research on provenance? What what is what is your thought process around provenance, and how do you go about it? I think it all goes back to how you source your work. Um, clearly, if you went to the street today, if I walked out of my house, I'm sure that one or two or three kilometers down the road, I will be able to find somebody who's selling an artwork of one sort or the other. Now, if you go up to this person and they're selling their work for you know, $3 or $5, to buy it from them and then tell them to try to tell you who did this work, how long did it take, which media did you use, I think would be you know, wasting their time and wasting your time. So when you buy artwork of that nature, and there will be artwork of that kind which is visually appealing for sure, but it may be difficult to try and ask them to give you the information that you need for provenance. What that means though, is that if you look at provenance as an important factor for your collection, then you need to sort of narrow down your, your focus to you know, either primary sources, so I either artists themselves, artists who can give you that kind of information, mixed media, is it a oil on canvas, etc. And then you also need to look at other sources like, you know, engaging with galleries, because galleries by nature and definition, the kind of work that they'll exhibit in their galleries must pass a certain mark or standard. And so it will be easy to get, uh, uh, to get information that you need about that. But the most important thing at the end of, of course, of course, you know, not to mention the secondary market. If you go into auctions, usually auctions are done by art houses, which have already, um, you know, they make sure that what they auction will be worth appearing in their auction. But, uh, you know, the other things like art fairs, uh, uh, etc. The important thing with provenance is that you must know what it is that you want to get in as far as information is concerned. And it's fairly standard information. So, one, you must get the name of the artist who did it. And as Jess told me, if you can, get a picture with them. Two, you need to know What's the name of the, of the artwork? What year was it done? What's the media that was used to do it? What's the story that the artist wants to tell behind it, if they have a story? Sometimes they say, look, I'm not going to tell a story. You can you know, defer, decipher it the way that you want. So those are key uh, parts of provenance for your artwork, you know, for future for you to be able to tell the story, for you to be able to deploy it into the secondary market if you wish to, or to pass it on to other people if you wish to. Uh, if you want to put it in a gallery or museum or whatever, that is important information which you need to research uh, in terms of problems. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for shedding light on, on, this, on, this, um, on this very, very important subject around provenance. Um, uh, so I'm just going to go to Gaston. 
Gaston Philippe. Um, so uh, Philippe, um, a lot of art collectors are sometimes overwhelmed with their collection. Sometimes it's a challenge, you know, to figure out how to store them, how to preserve them, how to keep them. Gaston, you know, in your own experience as somebody who's been collecting for a while, you know, how do you handle the issue of storage for your collection, Philippe? Uh, I have my, well, I have a storage uh, because, well, the art has everything. Uh, the art has something that is fine. If you take the example as wine, uh, if you want, uh, if you buy a good bottle of wine, you want to store it in the in uh, appropriate 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 place for you to able to degust to 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 test it better. So uh, the art is is like that. Either you your house is uh, correctly built and you, you store your your piece your your piece of art you put it in, in your wall or if you are doing a collection and you have quite a lot of pieces you need to be able to store it in the appropriate appropriate places and um, take it one by one when you want to show or when you have an exhibition so I have a big place where I can store my um, my art collection. Okay. Um, yeah. So a follow-up question to that will be, um, um, so tell us a story about your collection uh, because you have a quite an interesting story. You know, you've been, you, uh, generations in your family have been collecting. So kindly tell us about that and tell us, you know, tell us about that collection journey. Okay. So my story is, is quite easy. Um, it's coming from my roots. So I'm Caribbean and uh, in Cote d'Ivoire where I live, um, there were, at the beginning, uh, a movement of uh, art that had been teached by two Caribbean uh, professors that came from Guadeloupe, that have been based and that have been teaching in the Ivorian National Art School. The last uh, French governor uh, was um, uh, Caribbean, he was called Dineri. He was the last uh, French governor, not white, but mixed race, because I think after colonization, he um, did not want to have a white uh, governor. And he was my grandfather. Uh, my, and he wanted, he, he have tried, he, he was someone that really have a passion for art and have tried to, because of his stories, I think it was for him the best link to understand what was the, how Caribbean and African can understand each other um, and can emphasize emphas through art. So he started to buy a lot, a lot of art. He's been um, guided so by these two teachers and he's pro he gave that to his, um, to his uh, sister. Um, and after with the, the sister opened a foundation so the foundation is called uh, Guinere and they also do price, art price here in, uh, in Abidjan so we the, so the, 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 the gave the, all the art collection to my mom which was a daughter and uh, in my family, I believe I was the most uh, maybe sensitive or more free to carry on this, um, this art collection. So uh, here it is. So now we have a huge, um, huge art collection and we are able, our art foundation is able to help young artists in Abidjan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are able to do exhibition as well. That's the reason why I've opened this uh, Villa 306 here in Abidjan. All right. Thank you so much, Philippe. So I, I think we're going to start entertaining uh, a bunch of questions are coming from um, our, you know, our, our guests today, our special guests today. And um, Ijoma, there's a question for you. And the question is, please explain how the different categories of an artist, different categories of an artist is important for pricing art. I guess I'm saying the different categories of art as you know, and the artist is important for yeah. pricing art. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned three categories. You know, we have the masters and these are 
well-established names, like, for example, you mentioned Ben and Wong. Um, I'm talking about from a Nigerian perspective now. Um, ben and Wong, people like Ucho Keke, uh, Dimas Moko, and uh, those sorts of people. And then you have the mid-career artists who are like in between the masters and the emerging artists. And we can think of people like, let's say, um, Abiodun Olaku, um, Shegu Adejuma, and those sorts of people. And then, of course, the emerging artists. And these are artists that are just coming newly into the scene. And um, they are just at the beginning of their career. So you're not quite sure how their works will do in the market. You know, some of them, it's quite clear to see that their works will have like a good progression in the market. You know, but some, you're not quite sure. Yeah. And it's always not something that you can easily identify in terms of the emerging artists. You know? And sometimes as a collector, you're following a, a, an artist's career. So you're following them from when they come into the market and as they grow, you know, and their works add more value. You know? The masters, it's very clear. These are works that are already in the market. They have great value and they are very easily identified. Um, the mid-career artists, some of them are quite easily identified. But as Chio was saying, there are some artists that will be there and they might have great talent, but nobody is, is, um, is they are not uh, visible. Um, and they are not visible possibly because they are not managed by galleries or the, somebody hasn't discovered them and um, they have not been brought into the market in terms of like exhibitions or a gallery managing them or showing their work, or they have not been involved in major projects like art fairs, um, international art fairs, local art fairs. So um, those are some of the important fac factors that either make an artist work valuable or not so valuable. You know. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question here. Um, Theo, I'm going to push this to you. How can we push for more specialized art insurance coverage open to participants? How do you ensure that you are buying art that will be valuable or valued when buying from an unknown artist? How sure are you that you're buying art? Just say that again. Okay. Um, how can we push for more specialized art insurance coverage, one, open to participants? And how do you ensure that you are buying art that will be valuable or valued when buying from an unknown artist? Right. I think for, for specialized art insurance, it really depends on the sophistication of the market. So while you find that markets in Europe and the U.S. and in Asia are obviously much more developed, it's easier to at insurance as a product in many parts of Africa, that's not the case. And it's, it's, it's really because of obvious reasons. One, how deep is the secondary market in, in Africa? Really, it's, it's almost non-existent in many ways. You have, you know, a few auctions that happen like the sub auction in Kenya. I know that there's the auctions in Nigeria, um, but of course, South Africa, some parts of North Africa as well. But on the whole, you know, not a deep market. So insurance products of that nature depend on, 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 on the nature of the market. So it's unlikely that you will have the insurance companies offering this kind of service if it's not enough for them to be able to, 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 to make money, so, so, so to speak. So one of the things that we look at as, as Africans, first of all, is to say, how can we make our art market more active? How can we make the primary market more active? How can we make the secondary market uh, deeper? Today, if you have an African artist that you want to buy, especially the masters, the auctions that hold, the, the, the auctions where you can buy these um, artists are actually in, uh, done in, in Europe, primarily in London. So, Sotheby's, Christie's. If you want to buy an Enmono today, you have to go and buy it from London. There's obviously something wrong with that picture but it speaks to the nature of the market. So once we do those things that we as collectors, as promoters, as enthusiasts, um, to help develop that ecosystem, the market to become more sophisticated, then the insurance products will develop uh, you know, by nature, by definition. That's the first question. And the second one, the issue of value and projecting whether a work would be valuable in the future or not is, to be honest, can be almost as good as guesswork. 
uh, you know, some people that will appear to be on the rise today may, you know, peter out in, in, in the future. Which is why I insist in my view that first, it is art is a, is, it's a, it's a very complex subject, so to speak. So if you are, approach it from an investment angle purely, you must be deeply knowledgeable. The same way that uh, a commodity trader would, would, uh, would approach commodity trading. If you approach it from an investment angle, you need to be deeply knowledgeable. I am not a trader. I'm not an, invest, an art investment specialist. And there are very few across the world. So, which is why I always insist that if I'm to buy anything, the fundamentals to it must be that, is it visually appealing to me? Does it tell a story to me? Do I like it? Is this the kind of, you know, that I would like to go and put up in my house? Once I answer those questions, then the others become second. So if it becomes valuable in the future, well, thank God it has become valuable. If it doesn't, well, I still liked it. There was a story I had to tell about it. And that's the way it is. But, you know, to balance those two, it also helps that when you buy, you know, look at buying from, you know, primary artists that have got a link into the ecosystem, artists that have a certain consistency about the work that they do. So one of the key things that makes artists valuable is that they are consistent in the way that they produce their work. The media they use, the type of work that they do may be different, but they're consistent over time. But if you have somebody that produces an artwork for a year and then you never hear from them again, it's unlikely that that work is going to become valuable. So you take into account all those things and hope that, you know, to become valuable as you go into the future. But at the end of the day, buy the art because you like it, it appeals to you, it tells a story that you can relate to in a form or another. And of course, the other thing for me, I buy the art because it is art by contemporary, contemporary art by Africans. So my focus is only on art by Africans. I don't buy art by other, you know, because remember, as I said, there's a cultural symbolism behind that, which, which uh, for me is important. Thank you very much. Um, at symbolism that is very, very important. Very, very uh, what it you know. Thank you so much, Theo. So um, I, I want to welcome everybody again. Um, those who have joined us, uh, you know, after we started, you're welcome again. We're talking that this is the practice. We're talking about the practice for, of art collection, uh, the practice of uh, art collection, art business, brought to you by the Society for Art Collection. Uh, I just want to mention that we have two distinguished members of our, uh, three distinguished members of our governing council in the persons of Jess Castellote, Mr. Adido Tusilaimon, and Ms. Ngozi Edozian, uh, just to mention. Um, there's a question um, that's been addressed to Jess, who is a, a, uh, a very astute um, um, expert in this, in this, in this, um, in this discourse. So, hello everyone, um, great to be here. Ensuring arts is one concern in Nigeria, where I live. I typically factor the value into my property's fire coverage. How can we push for more specialized art coverage? Um, Jess, we would uh, like you to take a uh, crack at this question. Now, uh, I think that there are already products there, out there. I had a recent experience when we wanted to ensure the work in the museum. First, I thought that there would not be any specialized product. Then we approached through our brokers. We approached uh, several insurance companies and they offer products. Um, so I think there are products already there. Just go and, and ask uh, for them. It's not, I think it is not enough just with the general insurance that you have for the house. Uh, a proper insurance for our works are to, to identify the value of each artwork. Uh, they have to check the condition, they have to check the provenance. There are many issues there mm, for a proper insurance, but uh, there are specialists mm, and some of, the, some of the insurance companies are part of larger international companies that offer these services. So I think that's not a real problem if you are interested and you are ready to pay. Thank you very much, Jess. So uh, Mr. Adido Tusulaymon, we just want to ask, um, somebody is asking what 
um, companies provide good art insurance for Nigerian collectors in Nigeria, sir? Well, I mean, I don't know who does, but I know those who, who claim you know, they do. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I want to use it as a platform for advertising, you know, insurance companies and so on. But uh, clearly, uh, I know people who are insured with Connorsto Insurance, for example, who are collectors who insure with Connorsto, and they've been using it for years. I have seen AXA Mansat advertise, and I think I've seen a lead way advertisement on art. Now, I don't know of anybody who does that. I don't know how good they are. So, I therefore, uh, I will not take this as a testimony or, or an endorsement because I've not experienced them yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, just as a quick follow-up question, you're somebody who's seen as a very established collector on the Nigerian art scene and, you know, you are often a reference point for a lot of artists and art collectors. Just take us through, um, you know, a very short narrative about how, you know, what informs your collection and what you look out for when you're collecting? Well, let me just say, I'm not a sophisticated co collector, as people think. <laughs> I'm a very simple, I, I mean, my, my attitude to collecting is very simple. I have to like it. So I, I buy art primarily for me. And, and therefore, the things I buy are things that give me pleasure and and, and as it turns out for me, and I don't know whether this is the same for everybody, if I like something, chances are I will always like it. So, so for me, it's a continuous source of pleasure. Continuous source. So, and I did appreciate the value and so on. Those are all secondary things, of course. Now, of course, the more you collect, the, the more sophisticated, I would say, your taste is in terms of what you're looking for. And I've got the more other considerations coming to it, you know, uh, the, you know, the artist, the career track of the artist, whether the work will add value, you know, appreciate the value and all that kind of thing. So, clearly, the, what you have is a mix, what I, my is a mix of things I like. Some I look at it and I call it trash, but I like it anyway. And I make absolutely no apologies for it. And of course, I also have works by the so-called masters, you know, uh, that I know if I put them on auctions, what, what I'll, I'll get, get from them and all that kind of stuff. So that's basically my, my own approach to collecting. I basically surround myself with that that I, that I love you know, and that just gives me pleasure. Obviously, in doing so, and because I've been for a while, I have a collection that appears not just to me, but to a wide cross-section of people, which is another way of saying there are people who see the things I see, who see the beauty that I see, so it's not just that's that thing that I see is not for me alone. Other people see it. But the primary motivation for acquiring it in the first place is that I like it. If other people like it, fine. If they don't, as well. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So, Theo, uh, I'm going to come um, to you and, you know, now, um, how have you dealt with a situation where you were not able to? You know, you are not fast enough in purchasing a work that was probably put up, you know, um, for, let's say there's a, you go to a gallery, yeah, an exhibition, and there's this work, and somehow, you know, you were contemplating, and that work is suddenly bought by another collector. How do you deal with such situations, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's one of those things, and it has happened to me before. There are some works that come on, and they're very popular for whatever the you know, usually you go to a gallery, and this, this was in Uganda. So, you know, you like it. And sometimes, you know, it takes me for three days before I make up my mind about a piece. So you look at it, then you go back the second time, look at it the third time. But obviously, you must understand that as you do this, somebody else is supposed to be doing the same thing. And if they started two or three days before you did, it's likely that when you come back, you find that red uh, circle place next to the work that you thought that you would get. You know, it's, 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 it's painful sometimes because, you know, an artwork is an artwork. If either you have it or you don't. And that means that the next opportunity of that nature would only be if you now go into the second room, because the person willing to sell it at some point or they put it up for auction. But, you know, it's a disappointment. You, you know, pick up yourself and move on and hope that something else will come up. I think the important thing is that sometimes you develop a relationship with a gallerist. 
or if you have a relationship with the artists themselves, it's actually possible for you to book the work, so to speak, as you make up your mind. And, you know, depending on the kind of relationship, I know situations where the galleries can say, you know, don't sell that artwork because X has said that they're interested in it, even though they haven't put any deposit on it. No, that if they want, they'll come and take it. So at some point, it also comes down to the kind of relationships you build within the ecosystem um, to help you to avoid disappointments of that nature. Okay, so Q, just to you before I move over to Ijoma, somebody's asking a question. Um, Tio had mentioned that one of the considerations he gives when he collects art is that the artists who worked in um, is that the art artists that worked in two ecosystems. Can you expatiate on what you mean by that? Yeah, so the, the art industry is an ecosystem, and uh, the way that we've described it, I think Obina mentioned at the beginning of the of the of this of the webinar that I'm a founding member of the Contemporary Art Society of Uganda, Kasu, as we call it. There's a group of us; there's about ten of us at the moment. And the way that we defined it is that an ecosystem will be essentially focused on three things. It will be focused on, on uh, promoting, to be focused on buying, to be focused on uh, advocacy. And it could be any of those three. You could decide to do any of those three or all of them. So you could be a promoter, which means that you go to galleries, you attend art fairs and exhibitions, you attend um, art talks, lectures, those sorts of things even though you don't buy, right? You could buy and not do any of the others, but an artist, for them to build consistency and to be known within that system, they need to plug themselves in. So it's not good enough for you to sit in your studio somewhere, draw, and then go and put it outside your door, hoping that somebody's going to come and buy. No, you need to find ways. What galleries do you engage with? What art fairs do you, do you plan to, to attend if you can? both locally and internationally. Um, the education, talking about students, how do you plug in to students? Because those students at art school are the ones that are going to become the future masters uh, of the world. So how do you engage with them? Art writers and critics. You know, there are people that write about art, critique it. How do you engage with them? In a way that also helps because if they know about your art, they'll write about it. Um, um, uh, and, uh, you know, galleries have spoken about exhibitions. Um, government, and that's one, one, one player within the ecosystem that we tend to forget. The government has a duty of protecting the culture of, 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 of the country. And art is one of those um, expressions, one of the channels that is used to do that. To do that. So, how does government come in? How do we advocate that government funds the art, the, art, uh, the art industry as it's supposed to? Are there enough museums in the country to be able to tell the story for people that want to hear and understand art, the art history and all of that? And then, of course, um, you know, art historians, because it's important that the history of art is told and then you can relate that to you know, the contemporary. So all of those, you put them together, that's what we mean by the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So Ijoma, um, we're, we're getting to run down now. Um, so um, now people collect and collect and collect and collect. And sometimes people forget to review what they have, you know, take stock of what they have in the collection. So Ijoma, please tell us the importance of appraisal and, you know, appraisal of, your, of one's art collection and how often it should be done. Um, I, I think it's, important in terms of also just a collector yourself keeping stock of what you have in your collection number one you know that's very important so you need to do that appraisal and by appraisal we mean going through each artwork and just making sure that all the information that is there for the work the names and so on and so forth and also getting evaluation, which means like the monetary value of the work. You know, if, if you bought it at 10,000, for example, 10,000 Naira at some point, um, how much is it now? How much is it valued today in this market? You know, looking at all the different um, systems in the market, the auction houses, the galleries, you know, the auction houses are always like um, not 
not a benchmark really, because that's an extraordinary situation. Auctions are extraordinary situations, so artists should not actually be benchmarking their works against those prices. Because in the normal market, I mean, nobody can afford to be paying 10 million for somebody's work all the time. These are extraordinary situations. So that appraisal is important. Um, and also to see, because even though you own the thing going on around the work, people are still writing about the artists and the work. Um, the work is being put into publications, uh, the major publications or in, in um, catalogs and those sorts of things. And sometimes somebody can want your work for a major exhibition, depending on the value of the work and the artist. And you might want to loan the work. And sometimes they can pay you something for, for lending the work to them. You know, maybe a museum somewhere in Europe or somewhere in Africa wants the work, or somebody wants the work for a project. Or the artist even wants to borrow that work from you. you know. So there are many reasons why you need to keep appraising and you need to keep um, knowing the value of the works in your collection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've really, 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 really run down the time. Uh, we've just got about four minutes to, to end the session, but I'm just going to open up the floor to um, just a governing um, council member of the Society for Art Collection to just give us, um, you know, his own um, remarks on pretty much how to approach the critical uh, discourse of, of the practice of, of art collection. Jess. Well, um, if I have 40 minutes, I will try to enter into <laughs> to this issue. But anyway, I think the, the primary thing is to, to be very clear about why you collect. This is like almost any human activity. Why do you do this? Once this is clear, then you can say, how do, what is the best way of approaching this? If what I want is to enjoy our works, okay, do I need more works than the ones I can enjoy? Because I cannot display all of them in my house. Now, if I am collecting to invest or to leave a, a legacy for my children, if I am collecting for something else, then there are other ways and other means. So it is crucial to, to be clear. Now, this is not something that is static, that today is like this and I am very clear and there is only one reason. Things change. So perhaps I started in a way and now I have moved to a different way. And, and, and this, is, this is changing. But if now I am interested in building something, is when I do it in a way and then I do research and then I search and I look for, for what fits in what I want to create. If I am just buying objects that give me pleasure, then whatever I come across is okay. If I come across and I can afford it, good. And if I cannot, bad. but um, the, the, the why? Uh, there are plenty of other things, but I think we, are, we have little time, but why you collect? and then look for the best ways of achieving that way. Thank you so much, Jess. So thank you so much, Jess. So ladies and gentlemen, um, it's, it's really been a pleasure to have everybody. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are in the world. Uh, just before we go leave, we're going to take one last closing statement from all our distinguished panelists. So Gaston, um, let's start with you. Uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Gaston, you need um, to... Yes. Okay. Oops. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was saying, whatever, whatever you do in your life, is kind of, you can see it as a collection now. Um, art is something that is very particular. Art is something that um, we need to be educated to make sure that we are pursuing a good path, uh, despite the fact that we bank something that we love. Uh, but something that we love with time taking, um, getting um, ex become expensive and uh, to be able to have a right price and, um, we've, and continue to collect. We need to have uh, a teaching 
And I think that was, um, that was worth the time we, we have spent all together. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you so much. Uh, Theo. Thank you, Obina. I think, uh, let me approach it from a broader, a broad perspective to say, if you look at the art industry in the world today, it's essentially a trillion dollar industry, right? How do we, and here I'm speaking, you know, saying as Africans, what are the sort of things that we need to do to ensure that we don't get caught out again as we have been on many others of our resources in ensuring that we take our fair share of that industry? And I'm not looking at this from the perspective of individual gain, but from the perspective of how we can ensure that the way that our story is told, the way that our culture is expressed, the way that our traditions are told, generally the way that these stories are told is not misunderstood, and that where there's value in that, we gain from that value as a continent. Those are the questions that we have to ask, ask ourselves, and then do whatever it is that we can do, whether it is by promoting, whether it is by buying, whether it is by uh, you know, supporting artists in different forms, we do that because when we do, then we're ensuring that Africa has its stake in that trillion dollar industry at a higher level than it currently is. Thank you so much to you. And Ijoma. Um, the one thing that I think we didn't mention here is the power of the internet in, you know, in, in the art ecosystem as well. So I think collectors have a wider range of choices, collectors and potential collectors have a wider range of choices, you know, and they can easily do a lot of their research online as well. You know, you don't now have to wait for a professional to come and give you advice. You can also get some of this information if you want online. Um, and you can actually write to some of these institutions as well. You know, they always have a contact person. You can write to them if you have questions or if you need some professional guidance, you know. And of course, if you have a friend that works in the creative sectors, you can always look to them for advice in terms of where to, to um, how to start collecting or who to start collecting from if, you, if you're not confident enough, you know. And as you collect, obviously you gain more confidence, you know what you like, and um, you get more familiar with the sector. So um, it's not something that people should feel like it's um, you know, a myth or you have to be so well um, experienced in the arts or you have to know a lot about art. No, you don't. You start from somewhere and then you get somewhere. So that would be my advice to anyone that's interested in starting to collect. Thank you so much. Um, just um, something I just coming. Um, Ijoma, let me just let you handle that. It says, um, what is the social responsibility of a collector? You know, how, how, how is a collector socially responsible when he, in, you know, as he collects his, his pieces? Um, I think it's some of the things that Theo has already mentioned, you know, supporting your, your own local um, artists, of course, your, whole, your own local creative sector by, by buying from, from the artists that are within your own um, creative ecosystem, you know, and also supporting artists from other parts of the continent as well, you know, that's one. Um, and yeah, we talked about government, you know, it's also about advocacy, you know, the more voices are in the, the, the the better for the sector, the more support the sector has in terms of a, a lot of things. Um, artists as a collective uh, go through a number of challenges because um, most times we are not as, um, uh, how would you call it, uh, sort of uh, socially protected or we don't have those sort of strong unions as in other, other uh, professional, professional uh, careers, you know. So, um, artists need those sorts of support as well. So okay. I think those are very uh, important ways that collectors can also support um, the artists that they're collecting or the artists that are within their own uh, ecosystems. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, we have Professor Guillermo, uh, who is Franco Guillermo, who's in a very uh, highly distinguished, uh, distinguished um, <laughs> artist. In our so we're going to be asking him just a question, sir. Sir, um, welcome. Thank you very much uh, for taking time from your very busy schedule to join us today. We're really happy to have you. Um, what is, how do you see the role of the collector in society, sir? We would like you to, you know, talk about this. 
briefly, you know, what is the role of the collector in society, especially around his art collection and art collecting? Professor? Hello, sir. Are you there, sir? Professor Frank, okay, I don't think, I think he's at a Villa Shrine. Oh, okay, 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 thank you. I, I don't think he's, he was here and he came in anyway, uh, not a problem at all. Um, we also have um, Professor Uzioma Onyuzulike, <laughs> who was my lecturer while I was at the University of Nigeria. <laughs> it's nice to have you, sir. Uh, um, welcome. So, Pro Pro uh, Professor Frank is back, sir. Welcome back, sir. sir. Sir, you need to unmute. Hello? Uh, okay. Hello. Welcome, yeah, welcome back, Professor. Thank you. Nice to have you. Thanks to have you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. My pleasure. My pleasure, please. Thanks. To, yeah. It's my pleasure to join your group. Thank you so much, sir. So we're asking a question on what the role of the art collector is in society. Um, how would you, uh, have, you know, what, what are your views on, yeah, what are your views on the art collector being a socially responsible entity in society? Hello? Hello, Prof. Okay, I, I think his internet is um, it's not great. So, um, um, Professor Uzioma Onuzulike, are you there, sir? Well, my views are very much. Okay. I um, that the collector owns the capability of the artist to. Hello? Y yes. So, you, 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 we can't really hear you well. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir, but it, it, it appears to be breaking up, sir. Oh, there is. There is a broken computer. Um, maybe I continue to listen while the, see oh, okay. how the network gets better. Oh, oh, you can talk now. You, sound, you, seem to sound, you seem to sound a lot better now. Can you just try talking? Okay, I guess yes. this. Oh, I think it's still okay. The, the, the collector, like I say, is the is one person. So maybe you can turn off your video. It, it might also help with your bandwidth. If you turn hello. off your hello, sir. Hello, hello, prof. I, we can hear you, but if you turned off your video, it might help um, with your bandwidth. Maybe you know, if we just spoke and we heard your voice, uh, maybe that could help, sir. Hello, Prof. Okay, um, maybe um, let's just wait for a minute. Okay, I, I think it's still. I think it's still. I think it's still bad. So, but uh, Professor Uzioma, can you can you chip in, Professor Uzioma Onuzulike? I'm actually using this thing for the first time. I did. Let me find out how to. Talk. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, while he's um, sorting that out, um, Professor Ozioma Onuzulike. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Prof. Nice to nice to have you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can very well. So the same question: What what is um, tell us about um, the importance of of a collector being socially responsible and you know and his role in society? Um. Uh, what I think of immediately is that the collector uh, is an important partner in growing the arts, in um, helping the artist um, to grow. And uh, in that way, helping um, the art in general and the cultural industry uh, to grow. I think it is his such a responsibility to do that beyond um, just uh, um, the money that goes into his pocket. I think he, he should be responsible, or she should be responsible 
um, for the growth of this sector. And whatever he can do or she can do to do that is um, a very important responsibility. That's what I can think of at the moment. All right. Thank you so much. So Theo was going to say something. Theo. Yes, very quickly. I just wanted to mention, and somebody has mentioned it on the chat, that actually Jess Castellot has written a beautiful book about practice of art collection, the ABCs of it, which I've read and I found very useful as somebody who was, who was you know, um, doing that. So I would encourage anybody who can get access to that book to actually buy it and read it. Maybe Jess can tell us where we can find it, whether it's on Amazon. But it's a, a very well-written book on this topic. Yes. Thank you so much, Theo. Um, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this very special session. Thank you so much for everybody who was able to attend. Um, I'm going to say that, please, um, we, you know, the, the invitation is open to everybody to become members of the Society for Art Collection. Um, the website, www.satcall.org, is, is, is mentioned in the chat. Please endeavor to become a member. We're extending in a hand of, of welcome to everybody who is here. And please follow us on all our social media platforms at SATCALL. SATCALL is the acronym for Society for Ad Collection on, on Twitter, on Instagram. Thank you so much. We're going to make this recording available on YouTube. Um, we can we'll share in our mailing list to everybody so we can relieve these very important nuggets that we've shared. You know, and also, if you go to, um, once we get to the site as well, there is um, um, act that you can find links to actually buy the book, the, um, the book with art collection written by Jessica Solito, uh, Professor Jessica Solito and Professor Fabian Ajugu. It's a concise book, you know, that has all the information for art collectors and it's a very, very compelling read. For, for, for anybody who is actually serious about art collection. You know, we also have um, a book by the president of the Society for Art Collection in the person of Dr. Oki Anuyago. It's called Contemporary African Art, and it's a compelling, you know, um, compendium of his collection of Obinio Obin Nima's works. And, you know, and some really, really interesting write-ups by um, Professor Oki um, Chiki Aniako, or you know, the, the famed um, art historian. So very, very, um, very interesting assets that we can find. You know, just once we go to the Society for Art Collection website. Once again, I want to thank everybody for being a part of this webinar. It's it's been great to have you guys, and I hope we've been able to learn one or two things about the, the practice of uh, art collection. Thank you so much, and um, very soon we'll be having another. Another webinar like this, where we have to come like this, where we'll converge and talk about issues, germane issues affecting art collection and the practice of art business. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.